First of all, introducing our challenger. The enemy of the Lua Corner. He's going to step in and he does the ball over. Let's bring on the boom. This is Eternal MMA. All right, everybody, welcome back and thank you for joining me here once again on the Eternal Insiders podcast. We are officially back for the year 2024 and I am joined today by one of the very first men that I ever had the pleasure of talking to uh, way back when I first became uh, involved with uh, this wonderful promotion that is Eternal MMA. Uh, Going back a couple of years ago when I first started writing articles uh, way before uh, I took over from the podcast. So it is only fitting that I welcome him in as our first official athlete guest for the year 2024, one of my favorite men to talk to in the sport and your eternal bantamweight champion set to defend his title for the very first time at Eternal 82 when he squares off against Alan Philpot. It's Rod Costa. Rod, long time no speak, man, but it's always a pleasure when we talk to you. How is things with you? How is, uh, how is the start of your 2024, man? Uh, hey, look, always good to talk to you, man. Uh, it's a pleasure. Um, yeah, the year's good, you know, just, just um, as always, the last last couple of weeks, just I was just doing a workout and, and um. But yeah, 2024 is looking good. And so what have you been up to, man? I mean, uh, like I said, it has been a while since we sort of talked to you. Of course, we've got the fight and everything coming up. I mean, there's a lot going on at Scrappy MMA at the moment. I mean, you're obviously getting prepared for a fight. But I mean, your man, Jack Della Maddalena, I mean, he's getting ready for a fight. There's probably a lot of iron sharpening iron there. Uh, how is how is everything in terms of the vibe? How's the energy? Uh, how is everything going on down there at that, uh, that world-class gym? Yeah, it's great, man. It's always great, you know. There's always uh, people uh, getting ready for fights, you know. Um, as I said before, I like to always stay in the gym if I'm fighting or not. And um, and um, yeah, like it just it just happens that now, like Dell is getting ready for something, Beck is getting ready for something, um, you know, my fight and uh, Drillis is getting ready for something. There's a, there's a lot of guys at the gym. Most of the guys honestly are matched up, so, so it's a good uh, good vibe at the moment. Of course, I mean, it sort of really goes by where one of you guys has a fight coming up on a card, yeah, be it locally or internationally, that it's not uh, it's not all sort of all the guys sort of going to war at once. So uh, it must be a good feeling, like you said, I mean, Drillich and, uh, you know, and, and Jack Becker and everything obviously preparing for their fights. Obviously, Jack's got his fight coming with Eternal 83. So uh, is it sort of, is it making that much more of a sort of a special feeling when it's not just, I guess, just you getting ready for a fight, but it's all the guys getting ready to go for war? Does that kind of add to the motivation for like everybody in the gym? Um, I, I think so, but I, but for me personally, I, I don't think it's about the motivation, but it's about like uh, it's a little bit better in terms of you get pushed a little bit more, because um, like like I said, I try to always be in the gym, but if I'm not fighting, I'm probably not training as hard and I'm not as focused, and uh, you know what I mean. So if if let's say if Jack has a fight coming up and he's getting ready for something, he's sharp, he's thinking about his fight, uh, he's putting the 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 energy on and and he's and he's you know what I mean? You're more focused. So uh, when, whenever a lot of the guys are getting ready for something, you know, even the amateur boys, uh, it just means I think the training is just a little bit harder. You know, everyone you go with is, is, is kind of trying to, to, to win all the rounds, you know? <laughs> of course. So it just makes that, that much a little bit special, yeah. I mean, you know, speaking of Jack, obviously he's got a sort of big opponent coming up in Gilbert Burns. I mean, you know, not only a fellow Brazilian uh, compatriot of yours, but I mean also, you know, um, a highly competitive a uh, Brazilian jiu-jitsu practitioner uh, on the world stage. Uh, on the world stage, uh, same with you, uh, former medalist on the world stage in Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Have you ever crossed paths with uh, Gilbert Burns in your travels at all? Nah, not really. Nah, um, he's one of my favorite grapplers. You know, so it's gonna be sad when um, when um, when Della um, destroys him. <laughs> uh, not sad. I'll Bittersweet, be Della, but but he's he's one of my favorite. He's very exciting, and I feel he's very gangster that. that um, He's taking a fight with Della, you know. I'm, I know, I'm sure a bunch of people received that call and said no. Um, but I know I've never cr- cr- uh, crossed paths with him. I, I've, I've trained with a lot of people that that he's trained with. My coach, I think, knows him pretty well. Um, but I, I've never, I don't, I never met him. No. No, I mean it's sure to be a cracking fight, man. But I mean, you know, we got you to focus on, of course, uh, coming up first. But uh, obviously, uh, training there at Scrappy MMA. But how is everything going at the Costa Academy, too, man? I mean, it's a it's a beautiful looking place that you're going on together there. Uh, so you know, you're a very busy man. I can certainly appreciate that. How is uh, things running at the Costa Academy? It's good, man. I, f- I feel like I'm, uh, um, like I'm, I'm, kind of, I'm going back to training a little bit more, more jujitsu. You know, I'm still trying to focus in, in grappling for for MMA, but um, 
but I, I feel like it's corny to say, but I feel like I'm going back to my roots a little bit more. Not not just because of MMA, but I want to compete in the in the ADCC coming up as well. The trials, you know, I, I did the last trials. I, I did okay, but I was disappointed in the match that I lost. Um, and um, uh, so I want to go back to, to doing a, a couple of the the main the bigger jujitsu comps. So um, it's been great, man. I, I got a lot of people that help me out in the gym and. I have a lot of people to push me, and, and uh, I like having having those two atmospheres. You know, like I I train in the mornings with with the pro class, the scrappies, and and at night um, I do I do my gym, so I do two a days most days. So I feel I feel it suits me well. And how's that dog of yours, man? I mean, I think the first time I ever spoke to you, I mean yeah. that that beautiful dog that I I'm, I'm missing his face or her face. I can't remember. It's a boy that uh, the, the Rottweiler there. It's a boy. Yeah, the boy, the boy, that's right. Boy. I think the very first time I ever spoke to you, not that it was uh, for a podcast or anything like that, uh, but he was uh, he was causing a bit of mischief in around the background when you're at the gym there. So uh, how, how's he doing? Yeah. Uh, he was a little pup. Yeah, he's yeah. great, man. He's 50 kilos now. He's a, he's a 50 big. kilos, man. Oh, my God. Yeah, yeah. grappling partner. Yeah. I have a couple of videos of me grappling. I might put it online as a, yes. a warm-up. <laughs> nice. Yeah, we need that. That'll get all the views and all the clicks, man. Fantastic. I love it. <laughs> Now, of course, we've got yeah, a little bit to talk about, man. Now, we got to obviously the fight and everything come up. I want to just sort of cast back sort of over the last couple of years. I mean, if we talk about 2023 first. I mean, you know, I guess purely from like a mixed martial arts competitive standpoint, I guess, sure, to your admission that not, not necessarily a year for a couple of reasons. I mean, the start of 2023, obviously we lost a couple of fights through injury and that sort of thing. And then the end of 2023, a couple of fights back up at featherweight where you've normally fought. Unfortunately for yourself, they didn't go your way. Is there anything that you could sort of point to in particular as to, you know, maybe why things didn't fall your way in 2023? Or is it just a matter of like, hey, this is high level competitive mixed martial arts. There's injuries involved. Sometimes the wins go your way and sometimes it's just them's the breaks. Um, I'll, I obviously try to uh, look at every fight I lost, you know, the uh, and then see what I could have done better, why I lost and, 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 uh, and, and whatnot. Um, like I, I'll just say that, I, like I, I try not to to give excuses, and whenever you say anything, really, it sounds like an excuse, you know. And I, I don't want to fall into the habit of saying anything that might sound like like an excuse, and I won't. But uh, what I can say is that there wasn't a fight that I lost that I feel I couldn't win, you know. Uh, I, I've obviously made made mistakes, and and I've um, and I and I lost a couple uh, the last two fights, but. Um, I feel like I, I I can win those fights if, if I get them back, yeah, and I'll leave it at that, you know. But uh, but um, but I I, I don't feel that they were terrible losses either, you know. So I'm not I'm not I don't keep myself down like um, like I hear like I hear I hear um like Philport say that um, I'm a punch bag and and this and that, which is funny. Uh, but for example, if I'm trying to analyze the the fight that I lost with Ethan, um. He just out grappled me, you know. Um, he 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 not with the jujitsu. I don't feel. I feel like I did pretty well with the jujitsu, and but he just managed to keep me on the on on the bottom. His his wrestling was really good, and to be honest, I've always said I was the best grappler in uh, featherweight and bantamweight divisions, right? And uh and and Ethan proved proved that I was wrong. He's definitely the be the better grappler at um at featherweight, not just because he beat me, but he just won ADCC, you know. So I knew he was good. I I expected a real tough grappling match but he was better than 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 uh than i gave him credit for in terms of like you know he, he just wanted to see he's about to go to the to the biggest comp in, in the world um he won the trial sorry so um but but even within that fight you know my face was fully it was a bit messed up after the fight but it was literally two strikes that happened the first one was a knee when i was trying to play that that, that rule that you know i was touching the floor and then he caught me in the second that I, I lifted my hand with a good knee to the face, didn't rock me, just opened a cut, as you know, props to him. And then uh, during a scramble in the last round, which I think, I, if anything, the last round was the one that he could give to me. Um, you know, I'm not saying I won the fight. He won the fight for sure. But I reckon that, that last round, I did better than the first two anyway. Um, I think you could debate I won that last round, but he just called me off of a scramble. I try, I can't even look at the punch, what it was, and then my eye just blew up. So um, I feel, I feel Fupo just says those things to get under, under, under people's skin, you know. But um, anyway, I'm saying this because I, I try to analyze that fight, and I, I feel like just, you know, the reason why I lost is because he, he, he managed to secure those ground positions, keep me on the, on the, on the, on my back. 
you know. And uh, I tell the guys when I when I teach grappling here and at Scrappy sometimes when when I help out whatever they is don't be on the bottom. Uh, it doesn't matter how good you are in jiu-jitsu, don't accept the bottom position. And I accepted the bottom position a lot of a lot of times without a lot of urgency, you know. Uh, but I feel like that fight is something um, I can win. I didn't feel like like I was out of my depth. And even here, and like I beat him before, I've TKO'd him before, so I know I can beat him. But he obviously beat him. He caught me with a punch, and there's not really much to analy analyzing that fight. He just he he threw a good punch, you know, uh, good timing, caught me, and um, there's not much I can do when when my lights out, you know. <laughs> um, so I feel I feel like uh, my losses uh, haven't been that bad, if that makes sense, you know. No, I mean, if you go back to that sort of period not long before that, man, I mean, kind of that run between 2020 to 2022, I mean, you, you had seven wins just for the two losses. And I mean, you know, you might uh, be able to sort of talk about this as far as there was one loss there in particular where, you know, maybe that wasn't necessarily a loss. Of course, we can't look back yeah. on that. But I mean, that can't awfully fight. Uh, awfully yeah. close. Could have gone either way. Of course, the Jack Jenkins fight. I mean, obviously, that was comprehensive. But I mean, yeah. we, we know the level of fighter we're talking about with Jack Jenkins, obviously, well established yeah. in the UFC now. Uh, but that run of 2020 to 2022, just before that year, 2023, was um it was quite a big run for you, man. So, you know, it's yeah. we're not far removed from that. We said 2023 wasn't um, you know, a great year in terms of the actual results or anything like that. But when you sort of look back at that kind of time frame of that sort of three-year period, can you sort of look back to that and sort of get some, some inspiration, I guess, coming into the 2024 year and think like, all right, what is it I need to sort of get back? Is there anything you can sort of look to and think, all right, what is it about that period that I can bring back into 2024 and, and apply going into, uh, into this year from that good run that you did have? Um. Maybe, uh, maybe it, it could also just be a matter that the, the um, sometimes things just play out the way they play out, right? Um, so sometimes, sometimes it, um, I've made plenty of mistakes in the fights that, that I that I won as well that I can look at, sit down, analyze, and try to get better. Uh, but but guys just weren't able to capitalize, you know. So I, I just I choose to look at it in a way that I made those mistakes in the, in the, in, in the couple, in the last couple of fights and those guys capitalized on, on, on those mistakes and, and they won, you know, uh, honestly, those last two fights, I felt like I was out of my death and I got bashed and, and I fell out of place, you know, I, w I wouldn't have kept fighting to, to be completely honest, you know, um, I like not to dwell too much on it, but, uh, I know, I, th I think I guess in a way from from what you're saying, I, I know the the fighter that won all those fights is still here. I'm not. I don't feel like I'm decaying. I feel like I'm doing really really well at the gym still, and and um and I still got a lot to improve, like I've always had. So um yeah, we'll see how this fight will play out, you know, and uh and I'll try to minimize on, on my mistakes. No, I mean, I think that also, you know, if we speak about the caliber of fighter you are, man, I mean, in terms of like, you know, not giving up on yourself and that sort of thing. And to your point, saying even the fights that you did win, you know, making mistakes in those fights. But I mean, you know, those fighters weren't able to sort of capitalize on taking advantage of you in those spots. I mean, you being able to get yourself out of those spots. I mean, the fight goes from bell to bell. You know, it's about sort of how you finish the fight. And there's been a few of those fights where, you know, you have come out on top. Of course, the fight, uh, you know, with actual to get that Bantamweight title. I mean, classic example of that, man. So, uh, you know, everything from hanging in the pocket with Jack Jenkins, like it's always talked about one of the biggest things of Rod Costa is just the heart, never give up. And also love the attitude. I mean, you go in there and say, let's all put it on the line. It's no bullshit. Let's just, let's go out there and sort of see who wins at the end of the day. So uh, I love that attitude about you, man. It's, it's such a refreshing thing to see. And it makes me look forward to your fights every time. I mean, we've got this fight coming up against Alan Philpot. I mean, you referenced at the top of the conversation about his shit talking and everything. You know, whether you look at it as an entertaining thing, whether it's promoting the fight, whether there's any potential bad blood. I mean, that all aside for now, you know, when this fight originally got made, what was sort of your thoughts on Alan as an opponent, uh, you know, forgetting sort of the, all the banter? Like, just as an opponent, what were your sort of thoughts on that matchup? Um, I think he's a, he's, a, he's a good fighter. I think he's got good... Um good striking skills, you know, I think he's, uh, he look he looks very fluid on the, on the, on the striking. He, he looks like he knows what he's doing. He moves well. He switches stances, you know, um, he stays out of trouble and on the feet, at least from what I've seen. And, um, and his grappling is, I, I think a little bit better than people give him credit for just because there's been a, a plenty of times where, where he kind of gave up on himself on the ground, you know, but, uh, but his actual skill, he gets good positions on on good grapplers and 
and uh, I don't think he's bad defensively. Um, so, so I think he's, I think he's a good uh, skill wise. He's a good fighter. Yeah, so, I mean, you did reference there before, uh, you saw some of the things that he said, like, you know, calling you a punchy bag and that sort of thing, and I guess trying to get a rise out of you. Like, obviously, you've uh, seen some interviews. Maybe you've seen the one where he's come on the Eternal Insider Show. You know, one thing that he did give you the credit for, he said, you know, if this goes to the ground, Rod's definitely got my number there. Absolutely, that's where he sort of got the strength. Uh, He doesn't plan on it going there. He said he wants to sort of ping your head off for the entire fight. But, you know, what do you sort of make of that in terms of him sort of admitting out loud that, hey, if this sort of goes to the ground, he's giving you the clear, decisive advantage there. Like, what does that sort of do for you in terms of, uh, you know, what you think you can implement in that fight? Does that sort of give you any extra confidence that he's sort of selling himself out there is not thinking he can hang with you in that sort of respect? Did, did he say if he goes to the ground, he's going to ping me from the from the top? Is that it? No. So when he was on the podcast, uh, from memory, what he said is like, give Rod all the credit. Fantastic grappler. You know, you know, he, he's got my number there. Absolutely. His plan is, is that it's not going to the ground. And his oh, yeah. focus is he's going to ping your head off uh, for the entire yeah. fight without it going to the ground. His words, his game plan. But I mean, yeah. you know, he's definitely giving you sort of the plaudits there in terms of the grappling game. I think, I guess, look, look to be honest, um, I think he says so many ridiculous things that if he comes out and says that he can hang with me on the floor, uh, it's just it's just comical. I think people just laugh at him, you know. So um, I think that's what that's what it is. He says a lot of dumb shit, and uh, that's just one that that he knows is is, is not viable. That does that mean that he like like I said in another interview, he can't even submit me. Um, like he can hurt me, and then I'm not there, and he catches me, or he can even just catch me with something. Everything is possible, but. Uh, if he goes to the ground and I take him down and there's no other circumstances, right? I'm not hurt or I'm not, I, I don't have my leg broken or my, whatever. If there's, there's not another, you know, like, um, mitigating circumstance, he can't do anything to me on the ground. That's just a fact. Um, um, I think he's just, he's just, he just understands what, what, what's happening. You know? Uh, in, in terms of him, uh, no, no, not, not, letting it get to the floor. Um, I'm sure that's what his, his game plan is, you know, but I, I, I guess um, may, maybe, maybe, like his wrestling is good. I have to respect his wrestling. I don't think, I don't think I'm going to take him down whenever I want to. But the thing with me is I'm not, I'm not rushed. I'm not um, desperate to get it to the ground, you know. Hopefully I don't make a mistake like I did with, uh, with Van Hayden and get caught and get knocked out again, but uh, it's not easy to get me out of there, you know, and, and realistically, he's not the type he can, I'm not saying he cannot knock someone out, but in his last, what, six fights in the last, last, can you, can you remember the last time you knocked someone out? That's the question. Do you remember? No, I don't, I don't. And I'm not trying to uh, throw shade at him. He's a, he's a good striker. He's better than me at striking. If you kick box, he'll beat me. But, um, if you, I feel like, like generally speaking, if you don't knock me out, uh, eventually the grapple will happen. You know, that's what happened in all of his other fights. I don't think he wanted to grapple with those guys, but the grappling happened. So maybe he would adapt. Maybe he'll he'll change his strategy completely. But the 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 facts are the last few fights he had all went to grappling, um, and he lost those fights in in the grappling aspect. You know. Um, so uh, I, unless, I feel that unless he he hurts me on the feet early, by the by the by the third, fourth, fifth round, I'm taking him down. That's that's what I feel. I mean, where this all sort of start becoming a little bit juicy is I think you know that there was that potential of this fight being made, um, you know, previously before he got matched up, I believe, uh, with Paul Logo, and I think. There were some barbs from him sort of online, you know, sort of uh, you know, questioning maybe a potential injury you were sort of dealing with. And then it sort of came back in a little bit of maybe sweet irony for yourself when he pulled out of that fight uh, with the sickness and everything. And there was a lot of words and everything said online. And it was sort of like, yeah. it was almost sort of, you know, from, a, from an outsider's point of view, uh, un- unbiased for myself, but like, you know, sort of looking at it, um, you know, everyone sort of started pouring in, you know, just and even like former opponents of you, like, you know, it was almost that sort of like, hey, you've been sticking it to us, now you're pulling out of a fight a week later. Was that? How did you sort of take that? Um, you know, as far as you getting involved there, was that just a bit of fun for you? Was it a bit of like a, a bit of like an f you for sort of giving it to me, and you can sort of get your medicine back? Like, what what are those sort of interactions like for you when you get involved with that sort of thing? It's just a bit of fun. Look, uh, I don't know what happened to him. Um, 
he it, it might have been that he needed to pull out. I never thought I'd pull out from a fight, and then I had to pull out when I broke my finger because I can't. You know, like it would be too dumb for me to to fight with a broken finger. Uh, kind of need that, yeah. It, it, yeah, even even though like my I was feeling very good, I was physically fit. Uh, so I don't know. Maybe he he didn't have to pull out. Maybe he did. But just the way he says things, he's like, uh, "Oh, I really, really wanted to," and my team, uh, like, forced me out. Like, like, I, like, I, I have a team. I know how those conversations go. You know, it's either you shut up and you fight, or you complaining to your team the whole time that you're feeling this, you're feeling that, and they fucking have no choice but to say you can't fight. Uh, but that that doesn't mean that he he should have fought. I don't know. I wasn't there. I'm not gonna judge him. Without knowing, uh, it was just a bit of fun, you know. He 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 says so much stuff that uh, it was a little bit of fun of him talking so much shit and then and then uh, not knowing anything about what he's saying, you know, like making up stuff about me and about my injuries and about whatever stupid stuff he heard from from whoever he's he's friends with. Uh, it was just a little bit of fun. Maybe he he needed to pull out. I don't know. I mean, a little bit of focus on you, you know, of course, you know, what sort of led us to this point is, you know, you had a little foray down to the band and weight division, we'll say, uh, and took on, you know, uh, one of the best guys, I guess, that we sort of had in this country, you know, for a long time, locally speaking, Sean Etchell, a former flyweight champion for Eternal MMA, uh, and you got the job done there in spectacular fashion, and it sets us up for this big fight, uh, we get to go back down to band and weight, and uh, square off against Alan Philpot. so it's fascinating from a number of uh, dynamics, but I mean, you know, you guys share, I guess, Sean as a, a very recent sort of former opponent, of course. That was his last win uh, that sort of led into this matchup with you. When you sort of look at Alan, I guess, in comparison to a guy like Sean, do you think there's a big stark contrast in terms of what they present to you in terms of a challenge? Like, how would you sort of, I guess, rate the comparison of Alan uh, compared to going up against a guy, um, you know, again, one of the better guys we've got in the country in Sean Etchell? Um, I think Sean, I think Sean's a harder matchup in terms of like, Sean's intense, man, you know, uh, like from the stare down, uh, from the very first second of the fight, he's just coming forward and you can see he's just trying to hurt, you know, there's no, um, there's no, uh, like you can just feel when he's in the cage, you know, he's very aggressive. I think like he was maybe too aggressive against, against, um, too wild against, uh, Philport, you know, I think that's what he was, he's down for. I feel like if he controls that a little bit, he'll he be a lot more uh, dangerous. But um, I feel like maybe Philport uh, a little bit bigger and a little bit uh, maybe a little bit stronger in the in the grappling exchanges, you know, in the beginning anyway, and uh, and uh, maybe a little bit crisper striking, at least from 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 watching, you know. Uh, but I think I think the wildness and the unpredictableness of uh, of of uh, Etch was a little bit. A little bit more of an intimidating game, I feel. Sure. I mean, again, like, you know, very fascinating sort of setup in terms of the dynamic of you guys coming in with that former opponent. We set ourselves up. I mean, all the trash talking, that sort of thing aside. I mean, from Alan's perspective, he said there'd be no touch of gloves. I don't know, again, if that's for the sort of the banter for it. But, I mean, I was talking about this on the podcast last night with Daryl Martin. And I said, look, I don't know if it's necessarily you call this the people's main event, but I mean, it's Rod Costa, it's the HBF Stadium in Perth, Western Australia, it's, you know, it's the shit talking Alan Philpot and his Northern Irish fans. I mean, it's, it's just such a massive build up. And I mean, for all intents and purposes, what we know for, you know, this card, I mean, we're so far ahead of our ticket sales compared to what we were last time going to the HBF Stadium where we broke records there. I mean, it's just setting up to be a massive card, man. I mean, you've been doing this for a very long time. You know, you're in and around the Perth MMA scene. Like, can you put into words when you put that into context about how much we're growing every time we go back to HBF, you know, the turnouts, like, you know, the line out the door before the first uh, fights even off the card. Like, have you, can you quantify just that growth that you've noticed since you've been sort of starting, you know, in Perth, Western Australia? Like, and, and what sort of role do you think that, um, you know, the Perth fans and the Perth MMA community has uh, played in, in growing the sport nationally here? I think it's great, man. I think it's awesome. Um, yeah, it's been a massive difference since I started fighting at Eternal, you know. Um, like I like when I when I started fighting at Eternal again, uh, when I fought at Eternal, sorry. I think it's already pretty establishing in Perth, you know. Uh, although a lot smaller than what it is now. But uh, you know, like I, I think if I'm not mistaken, I, I'm not 100 percent sure on this, but I I, I think this the the history of Eternal is like Cam and uh, Ben got together, they did some business and. And then eventually Ben got, uh, joined Eternal and started dealing with the Perth side of things. So kind of Perth was a, uh, after, not afterthought, but it was like it happened later at Eternal. 
a Eternals life, you know, and now uh, like, uh, like I've been all around Australia in all of the Eternal shows, you know, I've been to Sydney, Gold Coast, Melbourne. I feel like Perth is the biggest show that Eternal has, to be honest, you know, uh, in terms of crowd and, and, uh, and everything. So, uh, it's just great. It's great to be a part of something like that, that, that's, uh, that is so professional as well. You know, like I've like also going to, I've been to a couple of fights with Della and, uh, and obviously UFC is, you can't compare anything to UFC, but, uh, you know, I, I fought, I fought at the little shitty shows at the, at the local rec center, you know, I've done a couple of those back in 2015 and it's, it's honestly night and day from that to, to what Eternal is, is now. It feels like a little mini UFC, you know, it feels really professional and makes us feel like, like professionals and, and, and like, uh, valued, you know? So it, it's, it's like, like, you're not ashamed to invite your family and be like, this is what I do. Uh, when you're fighting at, at Eternal, so so it's, it's great. It's been great to be to be like a. I feel at least for the last three years a, a big part of that. You know, uh, it's a brilliant sentiment, man. And I'm, uh, the, I think uh, the feelings reciprocated from your fans. You know, we know you know, how much you're sort of beloved in that community. We know there's always a big turnout for Rod Costa when he turns up uh, anywhere in the country, but it's certainly for Perth, the HBF Stadium in Western Australia. Hopefully, we break some more records there for that card. Uh, it, it's a huge card, man. Absolutely can't wait. Jealous not getting over for this one, but. Uh, you're right. I mean, it's just the, the Perth fans. Uh, there's just there's just sort of, sort of seems to be sort of nothing like him. And you see those in the UFC cards, you know, sort of when it comes to Perth and that sort of thing as well. It's just something in the water over there. It's something very different. It's yeah. something very special. And I'm sure you are forever grateful to be uh, a part yeah. of something like that. Um, last couple quickly before you go. So you go ahead, yeah, please, please. Talk, talking about that real quick. I went to the um, so so Wendella fought in Perth. Um, like I, 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 like me 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 back and a couple of the guys from the gym. Got a couple of the seats that Della had uh, on the crowd, and so we're sitting like behind from where the where Della came out, you know. And uh, and I've been to I've been to, to a couple of UFCs before, and honestly, I don't know if it's because Della was fighting and there was that much, I was that much more involved because I, I knew a friend that was fighting or or if or, or, or together with the Perth card, but that that Della fight with uh with Bobby um, Randy Brown with uh, Randy Brown in Perth and the whole card, Vogue and everything, that was like the best show I've ever been Wasn't to. Wasn't amazing, man. That was, that was amazing. Man. Yeah. Incredible. Just, like just spine FYI. tingling feeling, man. Like just top to bottom. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like I, I say, I mean, I've been to a few UFC cards. I, I think the, one of the first cards I went to was a fight night where uh, Robert Whittaker uh, versus Derek Brunson, um, you know, just at a, a smaller, smaller show here uh, way back a few years ago. And that was about as loud as I've ever sort of heard like an arena, like a smaller arena, uh, uh, sorry, arena. But I mean, that Perth show, man, that was just next level. I mean, I've been to all the Melbourne cards, you know, the ones in, you know, Eddie had stayed in a bit of a dud because it's a weird environment. Like that that Perth show, like just your, your hairs on your arms and everything, man, like standing yeah, up. Yeah. Like, you know, I took my best mate with me, you know, he's only just sort of started getting to fighting. He's just like, what the fuck is this? Yeah, like, man. you know, just, it's just next level, man. And it's, again, it's, it's the Perth crowd, man, and everything. It's a very special thing for sure. For sure. Yeah, it's hard not to be a fan if you go to one of those, to be honest. Hundred percent, brother. Um, you know, I was just gonna say before we do let you go, like obviously, you know, this fight is obviously for the band and weight strap. Uh, you know, you going down uh, to defend that. Spent most of your career obviously as a featherweight, uh cutting the weight to get into band and weight. I know you said in the past that you'd be happy to sort of bounce back and forth between the weight classes here. Uh internationally you'd look at potentially cutting down as a permanent band and weight. What do, what do you sort of see going forward, you know, with success in a title defense here? Can you see yourself defending the belt more as a band and weight? Can you see yourself spending a bit more time as a band and weight going forward? What are your sort of thoughts on where your uh, your weight classes lie going forward there? Um, I'm I'm open for whatever you know. I gotta I gotta see what makes sense uh, after. I wanna I wanna fight a couple of times this year and and uh, see where that takes me and and go um, and go opportunity for opportunity. You know, whatever, whatever comes, I'll, I'll see. It's not, it's not like I'm sitting down and planning my, my life anyway. Like, whenever I told you, when I said those things, it's like, whatever, I'm like, you know, like, I, I feel like one of those interviews, I was like, I had just done a couple of wins, so I'm like, oh, I might be double champ, and then the future's bright and this and that. So it's just like, I've never, even then, even for the double champ, I never really asked for it. Like, I, um, whatever Ben and Cam comes to me and, and, uh, and say they want to do, you know, or, or if, if Ben feels like there's an opportunity for me to fight somewhere outside of Australia, I think that's, I, I, I guess I'll, I'll say this, that I do want to do one international one before I, before I, I follow the career, you know, that would be cool. 
No, I mean, that's what we love about Rod Costa. I mean, any challenge is throwing your way, man. I mean, just putting your hand up and saying yes, regardless of the weight class. So, you know, it's uh, that's why you've got such a big following, like I said, in Perth, Western Australia and all around the country, man. So it's always a pleasure to watch you fight, no matter the weight class. And we certainly wish you all the best for Eternal 82. I know you've never been a prediction guy for any of these sort of fights, man. Uh, but do you have any sort of thoughts or any uh, any particular way you'd like to get the job done? There's a little bit of extra spice in this fight with Alan Philpott. Uh, the shit talking, all that sort of thing involved. How would you like to finish it up uh, for Eternal 82 with Alan? Um, I want to submit him. I want to submit him. Yeah. You want to see the tap? Whatever. If he gets to the floor, he's going to give me something. If he gets to the floor and I'm able to hold him and I'm, it's not like he doesn't just pop off straight away, he's going to give me something. I'll take whatever he gives me. But he's going to give me something. If, if I, if I manage to control him on the floor for a bit, he's going to, he's going to, he's going to fade and he's going to give me something. That's what I think. Well, we'll all be the beneficiary, beneficiaries, my apologies. We'll get to see how that all plays out. Goes down on February 10th at the HBF Stadium in Perth, Western Australia. Quillen Soulkilled versus Don Marfan at the top of the billing there for the lightweight title. But we've got Rod Costa versus Alan Philpott for that bantamweight title. Absolutely cannot wait for this one. You still can get your tickets at EternalMA.com. They are selling very fast. We're about to set another record. But, of course, if you're not going to get there live and in person, you can check it out. Live and exclusive on UFC Fight Pass broadcast around the world. Rod. As I said at the top of the show, man, always a pleasure talking to you. Thank you very much for your time as always. All the best at Eternal 82, man, and uh, we will see and talk to you on the other side. Thanks, Luke. Always great talking to you, brother. All You're the, the best, best, brother. Thank you. Thank you.